Well, good evening, everyone. <clears throat> hey, I want to tell you this uh, cute story. <laughs> Funny story, but more cute than anything. Story is about a little boy who um, he wanted a hundred dollars for a little guy. Hundred dollars is a lot of money, so he prayed to God for an entire week. Nothing happened, so he decided to write a letter to God requesting that hundred dollars. Now, when the post office got a hold of this letter addressed to God, you know what they do? They forwarded it down to, uh, up to the White House, to Washington. So for whatever reason, I don't know how this happened, but the president got a hold of this letter. Touched and amused and impressed, he, he called his aide to uh, send this little kid $5, thinking that $5 is a lot of money for a little boy. So... Off the money went. The boy received it, and he indeed was delighted with the money. But as he uh, sat down, he immediately wrote a thank you note back to God, which read this. Dear God, thank you very much for sending the money. However, I noticed that for some reason you had to send it through Washington. And as usual, they kept most of it. <laughs> They walk among us. <laughs> well, hey, tonight we're going to be in John chapter 9. Now, listen, of all the books in the Bible, John chapter 9 is the humorous chapter in all the Bible. It's a story of a man who was born blind from, uh, born blind. from birth. He was blind. And what makes the uh, story funny is what everybody else thinks about him. Now, the story is about Jesus who heals this guy, this blind man. But we see different groups of people, the point of view from the, from the Pharisees and what they think of him. We see the point of view from the family and what they think of him. And the disciples and even the crowds, we see what they think of him. Now, in the end, you conclude that everyone in this story is blind. Everyone. The only person in the whole chapter that can actually see is the guy who has been blind from birth. <laughs> and he can see not only physically, but spiritually. Now, now listen, you know when, when the Holy Spirit was inspiring John to write this, I bet he was just laughing at this whole story. It's a great chapter for us to look at when we want to see spiritually. Because we, we struggle with this. Wanting to see God's call for our life, God's purpose for our life, His future for our life. We want to see how God wants us to act and behave in certain situations, yeah? And we want to see how to make good decisions and how God wants us uh, to behave when we struggle, when we're hurting. All of this we're going to find out tonight. It's a wonderful chapter because, listen, how many of you want to see God working his light in your life. Yeah, we all do. Tonight, we're going to look at four things that keeps us from seeing spiritually, four things that prevents us from seeing spiritually, and then four things that enables us to see spiritually. So four and four. I had it all numbered on your notes, and I found that I was messing it all up, so I just put bullet points. <laughs> so four observations, four applications. Now, the story starts like this. Jesus and his disciples, they're walking along and they come across this man who has been blind from the day he was born. And, and the disciples have a question. So in, in verse 2, it says this, Jesus, who sinned? This man who was born blind, was it him or was it his parents? Now, think about that question, right? How could it have been him if he was born blind? Back in the days, the teachers and the rabbis, they actually believed that you could sin in the mother's womb. And if you did so, um, you would bear the punishment upon birth. Now, everybody, just say ludicrous, ridiculous, because it is. That's crazy. And then there were others that thought, thought uh, it must be something terrible that the parents did that he'd be born blind. So the disciples, they show their spiritual blindness in this question. Why is he blind? Now, the disciples, they looked at this guy as a, a case study. They had no compassion for him. They saw him as an object of uh, theological discussion rather than an opportunity for healing. But Jesus didn't. 
every time we see Jesus, he's meeting people. And, and while there were moments of these huge crowds around him, never miss the fact that Jesus always saw an individual and their need. New Hope has a lot of people. Midwick has a lot of people. And I bet you're sitting here tonight thinking, I wonder if God notices me. Yes, he does. Even you. The disciples said, who sinned? This man or his parents who was born blind? Now, in saying this, they revealed the first thing that blinds us spiritually. The first thing that keeps us from seeing spiritually, right here in your first bullet point, either or thinking. Either or thinking. Whose sin was it? Either him in the womb or his parents. It's got to be one or the other. And then Jesus answers this like this in verse 3. Neither this man nor his parents sin. This happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. See, many times we narrow our thinking into two options, right? It's either this one or that one. It's either that or this. It's either one way or the other way. And we wonder why we can't hear God's will for our lives. It's, it's like, um, I either got to take this job, which I kind of hate, or uh, go on unemployment or face bankruptcy. It's got to be one or the other. It's either I get married or be lonely for the rest of my life. It's one or the other. See, we put ourselves in these either or, one or the other situations, and then what? We can't see God's will for our lives. Did you know that sometimes God has a third option? And that's how we get past this kind of blindness. Open your minds to something new that God is trying to do in your life. And when you feel like you're trapped with this either or thinking, and you finally conclude, man, this cannot be. Neither one or the other. It's not God's will for my life. Take a step backward. Take a deep breath. And just ask God, what is your third option? And you know what was God's third option in this story? His option was Jesus' miracle. And Jesus doesn't do miracles to show off his power. Jesus does miracle to show his compassion, to show his love, to show his character. Here is the character of Jesus in verse 4 and 5. Listen to this. As long as, it, as long as it's day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. But while I'm in the world, I am the light of this world. The scripture is saying that today, only Jesus can bring light into your life. Verses 6 and 7 says this. Having said this, Jesus spit on the ground and he made some mud with his saliva and he put it on the man's eyes. Listen, that's the method, right? What he just did. Put the mud, the, the saliva on the guy's eye. Method. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So the man went and washed and he, he came home seeing. <laughs> that was the blind guy following Jesus' instructions. So two things happened here. There was a method and then there was uh, following Jesus' instructions. Now remember, this is just the method he used. Jesus is the miracle. Jesus is the light. He went, he washed, and he came home seeing. Blind from birth, he sees for the very first time. It's an incredible miracle, and it's worked by the power of God in Jesus. So what helps us see spiritually? Four things that keeps us from seeing um, that keeps us from seeing spiritually. And the first one was either or thinking. And then there's four things that enables us to see. The first one is this. Obeying Jesus in the ordinary. Yeah, obeying Jesus in the ordinary things of life. See, obeying Jesus in the ordinary things of life will allow this blind guy, this blind man, three things that happen that enables him to see spiritually. And this is where the, the, the miracle happens. It starts when you start to obey Jesus in the ordinary. So the, the guy starts to follow the commands of Jesus, right? Obeying Jesus in the ordinary. And then he actually meets uh, a few challenges head on. The crowd, the friends, the family, the Pharisees. And then he's going to answer the question that Jesus asked him. So there were three things that happened right after this. He follows the command of Jesus. 
He meets some of these uh, challenges head on, and then he answers the uh, question from Jesus at the end. Jesus says, I've put, I've put some clay on your eyes. Now go down to the pool that's called the scent, and I want you to wash them. What will happen in this man's life spiritually is the reason why he gets healed physically. And for the rest of this chapter, we see this guy going on an extended journey on his way to spiritual insight. He's obeying Jesus in the ordinary. And Jesus is preparing the man for what's going to happen spiritually when he gets healed physically. He says, I want you to walk down through the city streets. There'll be um, a lot of obstacles. It'll take a lot of time. It's a long journey. But when you get to the water, you'll see. And in the end of the chapter, he's going to reach the living water, Jesus Christ. He's going to meet with him. And again, he's going to really understand what's happening. He's really going to see. Obey, obeying Jesus in the ordinary. See, that's where the miracle starts. When you move past that one way or the other, that either or thinking, and start depending on God, it's a simple process when you think about it. That's when the miracle starts. But um, let me give you a warning about this. Don't confuse methods with miracles, like thinking the mud had something in it or the spit had some healing ailment. People will confuse methods with miracles. God has different methods for our lives, but when we, uh, we will be in the darkness when we start fixing our hopes on the mud or our hopes has to be on Jesus Christ. It, it's God who heals, right? Yeah. Only God can do that. See, God will use prayer. God will use the anointing of oil. God will use the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he'll use even my own body to heal. Or he can use a combination of any of these. But listen, church, it's not prayer in and of itself that heals. It's not the gifts of the healing, gifts of the uh, Holy Spirit in and of itself that heals. And it's not medicine in and of itself that heals. Only God can heal. It's God who heals. And, and God can use a combination of any one of these things if he chooses. But ultimately... God heals, and he'll use some of these things to heal too. Amen. Even with the greatest of things that God has given, don't confuse the methods with the miracles. You know, it's interesting that there was probably a reason why Jesus used this method. In that day, they believed that the, the, the spit, the mud, they had healing power. And Jesus was doing something medicinal when he put the spit on the man's eyes. But by doing that, he was helping to move this guy's faith. It's all about Jesus, not the spit or the mud. He was doing just what needed to give this man the ability to put some faith in Jesus. Because right at this time, I got to tell you, this guy's faith must have been close to zip, right? Blind all his life, since birth, and Jesus comes along, mud, spit, tells him, gives him some instruction, the guy follows Jesus was there to give him uh, enough faith that he would follow his instructions. He was inviting faith into his life. Hope that's as clear as mud. Right? <laughs> Boo. So, so what happened uh, was um, this opened the way for the blind guy to follow Jesus' uh, Jesus' instructions. Don't confuse your participation with God's power. So, the man sees there's a crowd of people who have seen him all his life. He's been blind. He's been a beggar. How do you think um, the people, his family, the crowd reacted? In verse 8, it says this. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? Some of them claim he was. Others said, no, he just looks like him. And then the guy himself says, oh, I mean, uh, it can't be him. And then the guy says himself, I'm the guy. I I'm that man. It's hilarious when you, I mean, John's writing all of this thinking, this is crazy. How, how were your eyes open then, they demanded. 
I mean, there was a miracle that just happened. The guy can see. How are your eyes open then, they demanded. He replied, um, the man called Jesus. He made some mud. He put it on my eyes, told me to go down to Siloam and wash. And when I wash, I could see. Then they say, oh, where's that man? I don't know. <laughs> he doesn't know. I mean, there's all this commotion going on. Another thing that keeps us from seeing spiritually, doubt. Doubt. See, they couldn't believe that uh, this healing had happened because it never happened before. No one has ever been born blind and was healed. They let their past experience determine what was possible. Sometimes we live in the dark because we are convinced, we convinced ourselves that the light is impossible. Jesus is the light of the world. Listen, is reconciliation in your marriage possible? Nothing is impossible with God. Is Christianity possible? Jesus is the light of the world. Is it possible for God who created everything could personally love and care for me every moment of every day? It sure is. Is forgiveness possible? Is freedom from guilt possible? If, is, is there a real sense of purpose and significance in our lives? Those things are all possible because Jesus is the light of the world. Don't let your past blind you to the possibilities of what God can do in your life. You can learn a lot from this crowd, just the way um, they're asking those questions. See, they ask a lot of questions. Nothing wrong with asking questions. But the questions they were asking was more like to gossip or to demand or to doubt. They were asking questions to stall. The problem is we ask questions, but we don't listen for the answer. If you want to overcome your doubts, keep asking those same questions, but start listening for the answer. It might surprise you. Why God me? Yeah. Do you really want to know? In this story, they, um, they got the first part. They asked the questions, right? But they didn't do the second part. In verses 13 to 7, they, we are introduced to another group of people having a tough time, the Pharisees. The third thing that keeps you and I from seeing spiritually, that prevents us from seeing spiritually, is man-made rules. Man-made rules. Those keep us from seeing spiritually every time. In verses 13 and 14, it says this. So, <clears throat> They brought, the, uh, they brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. That day, the day that Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes, was the Sabbath day. The most incredible miracle. Blind from birth, and now he sees because of one thing, but it happened on the Saturday. Jesus broke the rules. They had people so afraid of breaking the rules. The, you know, the Sabbath became more of a funeral than rather than a festival. <laughs> people lost the joy. Everyone was afraid on the Sabbath. They were afraid to walk anywhere, right? Can you imagine something that was supposed to be celebrated? They're afraid. alka was afraid to fizz on the Sabbath. <laughs> That's how bad things got. This fear destroyed the worship and celebration of God. It blinded them. See, a man can walk for the very first time. A man could see who would never seen before. And the Pharisees, instead of rejoicing with him, all they could see was Jesus broke the rules and it was on a Sabbath. It blinded them spiritually. Man made rules. They lived by these, by these rules for years. These rules had become the center of their existence. See, your future does not have to justify your past. The Pharisees could, they couldn't accept Jesus because it would have meant admitting that they were wrong. <laughs> they, were, they were wrong. Why settle for darkness when you can't admit that you need the light? I think one of the reasons we read so much and we understand about these Pharisees in the gospel is because um, we're so often much like them. We all have a tough time admitting we were wrong. Three words, I was wrong. <laughs> Get used to that. Simple. It'll, it'll stop everything in its tracks. What keeps us from see, uh, seeing spiritually? 
man-made rules. And then the last thing that keeps us from seeing, we all understand this one because this one is common. This is what keeps us from seeing spiritually fear. Fear. The man's own parents faced this. That was a tough life for the parents. Pharisees could not believe that this man had been uh, blind from birth. So they call in the parents. Verses 18 to 23 does this. Listen to this. Hey, is this your son? <laughs> is this the one who was born blind? How is it that he can now see? We know that he is our son, the parents said. And we know that he was born blind. But how he can see or who opened his eyes, we don't know. He's of age. Why don't you ask him? He can speak for himself. Wow. Is that throwing him under the bus or what? Yeah? <laughs> so anyway, verse 22. His parents said this is because, uh, the parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews because already the Jews had decided that if anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ, they would be put out of the synagogue. So, they knew who did it. They had, you know what? Right there, they had a chance to glorify Jesus, right? But the fear crept in. <laughs> the fear kept them from uh, glorifying Jesus. So listen, listen. Before you judge the parents, it, it, it's sort of like this, okay? Um, how many of you know, know Social Security? Social Security, right? Social Security, Medicare, retirement benefits. Being thrown out of the synagogue it's like losing all three. You lost your Social Security, you lost your Medicare, you know, your medical plan, you, and then you lose your retirement plan. You, you lose the opportunity to, um, to come into church. You lose the fact that you are humiliated before God and the people of God. That meant you were publicly humiliated in front of God's people. That's what it's like to be put out of the synagogue. It's a simple answer for us today. You know, it's being willing to lose it all for Jesus Christ. That's for us. These people were living in real lifetime with Jesus walking, and it they, they was kind of new to them. You know, I'm certainly not there yet, but the closer I get to understanding what Paul meant when he said, for me to live is Christ." And to die is gain. Philippians 1.21 The more you start to understand what we have in heaven, the less fear has a hold on our lives. Because we aren't, um, things aren't as important as it, it really is when we know we got heaven wrapped up. I, I had a friend here, I had a friend here who um, used to come to this church and he had uh, died early in the year of cancer, right? Uh, his name was Bill. And um, he struggled with that cancer for about a year and a half or two years. And during that time, I would pray for him. Sometimes he would come to church. Sometimes he couldn't because, uh, you know, up and down. He was going through chemo, radiation. You feel lousy when you go through that. And I, I could see it in him. And I, I would always ask him, Bill, how you doing? And he would go, oh, I'm good, I'm good. Uh, about a year and a half later, um, I asked him that question, Bill, how are you doing? And he said, you know what? I'm tired already. I'm tired, and I'm just going to leave it up to God already. You know what he was saying? Because um, later on, about a month later, he ended up in the hospital, and the wife told me this. The wife said, you know, when I brought him to the hospital, he said, hey, let me go home already. Let me go home. And <clears throat> the wife said, what do you mean you, you want to go home? You know, let me go home. And then the wife said, okay. And he just smiled at her. Because he knew he had Jesus wrapped up. So let's see. Heaven, no more pain, no more fear, no more crying. Radiation, chemo, feeling lousy. Feeling lousy down here, loving it up there. You make the choice, right? Going through all of that. He was fighting something that he felt, why am I doing this? I go in heaven. He had a grip on what he had. Jesus was inside of him. What keeps us from seeing fear? Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ and put him above everything you're going through. The parents' action shows us the power of the, of the Pharisees, right? They would deny their own son. Yikes. And it shows the power of legalism. These men had the power, 
But Jesus didn't stay under that power. And neither did the man who was healed. See, what enables us to see? Now, the first one was start obeying Jesus in the ordinary. And then number two, you start uh, to see spiritually when you can see Jesus in your circumstances. When you see Jesus in your circumstances. In the beginning, the Pharisees are in control. But the second part, the man is, the man is in control. They bring, him in, they bring him in and they say, give glory to God. Call this man a sinner. And then he replies, whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind and now I see. Yeah. I was blind and now I see. That's the best answer, I think, in the whole Bible. It's so simple and it's so clear. I'm going to tell you three stories. In the 1700s, a man named John Newton picked up that line from the hymn that we sing, Amazing Grace, right? How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I was once lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. You know that guy, John Newton, was a slave trader. Not a slave owner, a slave trader. He went... He was in that triangle of slavery that went from Africa, Europe, to America. He was a part of that. He was one of those people who traded slaves like cattle. He didn't care if a few of them died on the ship, as long as, they, as, long as most of them made it. He didn't care about going into a tribe and stealing these people out of their own country, ripping them from their own family and their roots until Jesus got a hold of his life until Jesus gripped his heart and he recognized how spiritually blind he had been. He saw for the first time. I think one of the reasons we love that song so much is the words, the words affect us deeply. And when we know stories like this, it simply says that what has happened in many of our lives, we are all blind, but now we can see. Another hymn writer named Fanny Crosby she wrote more hymns and more hymn books than most people. Blind from just a few days after birth, when she was eight years old, the time she, she wrote one of uh, these poetries, and the, ro the words go something like this. What a blessing I enjoy that other people don't. To reap and to cry because I'm blind, I simply won't. Why? Because she knew the Lord. She knew Jesus. And she knew that he was the light of the world. She already saw spiritually. She saw something that other people didn't see. I was blind, but now I see. Chuck Swindoll talks about a good friend of his, Dr. Jack Cooper. Dr. Jack Cooper is an eye surgeon and an ophthalmologist. Dr. Jack was known to have worked on people who have been blind. Some of them from birth. Some people who have never seen before or has never seen for years and years and then for the first time they can see. Can you imagine what it must be like? Dr. Jack Cooper enjoys this because he's a believer. But he also understands that there's two kinds of blindness, physical blindness and spiritual blindness. So he has an, he has an eye chart in his office and when he sits the patient down, on the wall is this eye chart. And when he unwraps the bandages from their eyes, and then when they get into focus, he asks them to read the chart on the wall. And it says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. See, Dr. Jack had just given them sight. He's able to talk to them about the fact that unless you can see spiritually, there's a blindness that is greater than physical light, physical blindness. In the Jesus story, back to Jesus, this blind man goes, from, goes to the chapter, chapter 9, right? And the Bible gives us more and more light to who Jesus is. Verse 11, the blind man says, um, he's the man they call Jesus. So he kind of doesn't know, but he knows Jesus. 
He, he has an idea of Jesus. And then in verse 17, he says, Jesus, the prophet, he's becoming enlightened. And then by the end, in verse 38, he says, Lord, I believe. <laughs> From a man to a prophet to the Lord, slowly enlightened. But it's not until he meets Jesus for the second time. The first time he met Jesus, Jesus said, go and wash in the pool. The next time he hears Jesus speak, and by the end of the chapter, when Jesus walks up to him and says, do you believe in the Son of Man? And he says, yes, Lord, I believe. There's two parts of trust to this. What enables us to see? Enlightenment. Enlightenment with Jesus in your life. And what, it, what else? The, num the other thing that enables us to see, and this is your last bullet point, commitment. Commitment to Jesus in your life. There's enlightenment. We all know Jesus, but there's also commitment. Many of you are here where enlightenment has come, and you know about Jesus. You know who Jesus is, but the commitment hasn't happened yet. I was in church for years before the commitment came. Tonight is your night. Tonight is your night. And if you have that enlightenment in your heart, you can finish it off with the commitment. I'm going to ask if you would bow your heads with me right now. And we're going to pray. And if you feel like you want to give that commitment, go ahead and lift your hands right now. As I pray for you, go ahead and lift up your hands to say, I commit to you, Lord. Father, I thank you. Father, just to say that your heart, Jesus Christ, and I admit to you without you, I am spiritually blind. I admit how much I need you. I, I, I ask that you just touch my eyes right now and help me see. I see the enlightenment, but Lord, I need that commitment. Man, if that's you, go ahead and lift up a hand right now. And by doing so, you said, man, I give that commitment to you. Yeah, go ahead. Only God in you sees that hand. And lifting up that hand, you say, I am committed to you. Would you go ahead and pray this with me, everyone? Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, thank you that you came and died for my sins that I might have life everlasting. Lord Jesus, I am enlightened by you and now I am committed to you. I give my life to you. I give my soul to you. And you guide me. You are the light of the world. And now I say this so that you can hear me. So that I can hear myself. And so that everyone around me can hear. And so that the devil can hear. Jesus Christ is my Lord. He is my Savior. I belong to him. In Jesus' name. And Lord, that's the cry of our heart. To not only be enlightened, but to be touched by the light of Jesus Christ, which means we are committed to following you. Heal us, Lord, in Jesus' name we pray. Everyone says? Amen. Well, let's stand up as we conclude with our last song.